A human being is not a person because he is a human being, but because rights and duties have been ascribed to him. Specifically, the person is that legal subject or substance of which the rights and duties are attributes. But not all humans are persons, as was the case in Old England when there were slaves. Black's Law Dictionary, 3rd Edition. One of the biggest problems many people seem to have is understanding exactly what a person is. Now, I've stated before that you aren't a person, you have a person. And in order to understand what I mean, I ask that you look at the, the meaning of the word person and the assumptions that it's resting upon, the implications it creates. Historically, a person was a mask, it refers to a personage and it was what people wore when they were on stage. Now this is very important because if you come to say a masquerade party and you're wearing a mask and you're in my party then I can pretty much assume that you're my guest and you have agreed to act within certain parameters. Some people think that they can enter into an agreement with their person or as they refer to it their straw man. The courts have recently held that that's not, in fact, possible. It would be very much like me entering into an agreement with my mask. The mask is evidence of a person. Or, let's, for the purpose of this uh, demonstration, this mask is the person. It's a legal fiction. It exists so that others can, can interact with me, and so that they have evidence of my consent to their governance. That's why you can't enter into a relationship, into an association with your mask. Your person isn't something which exists in association with you so much. It is something that exists because of an association that exists between you and other people. And saying that you're going to oh, copyright your name, or uh, secure your person, or redeem your person, to me doesn't make much sense. Either you're in a relationship, in an association, and thus you have a certain body of rights and duties, or you are not in that relationship and you are free of those duties and you have no claim to the rights or benefits. People have tried to act as agent for their person in court, and it has failed repeatedly. Many people have what I believe to be uh, seriously erroneous beliefs concerning what a person is. They believe it was created by the government, that it exists completely distinctly from them, that they can seize it, perhaps redeem it, or enter into agreements with it. I do not see how that is legally possible. Your person is that thing which exists because of a relationship between you and another party. It identifies your rights and your freedoms and your duties and obligations within that relationship. I don't see how you can enter into a relationship or into a contract with something that exists because you're in a contract with someone else. Suppose a man and a woman get married. They become husband and wife. Now the man then decides that he wants to enter into a relationship, an agreement, with the husband. And then he goes out and he has sex outside of marriage. And the woman, the wife, comes and angrily asks him, Hey, what are you doing? And he says, Well, it wasn't the husband who was cheating on you. It was the man. Is that possible? Does that make any sense? I don't think so. Your person identifies you essentially as a child of the province. Attempting to enter into an agreement with it and going to your nanny and saying, look, I'm in agreement with this thing which identifies me as one of your children, merely uh, confirms the fact that you are acting like a child. Your person is considered to be a benefit. And I guess if you're choosing to live your life irresponsibly, it might actually be one. However, if you accept the benefits, you're bound to bear the burdens and to refuse to bear the burdens because you enter into an agreement with the legal entity that exists because of an association between you and the people who take care of you, it, it does not make lawful sense 
Furthermore, I believe this has already been looked at and judicially reviewed by some courts, and they found that the human being and the person are in, uh, entangled uh, to such a degree that you cannot enter into a relationship with it. You, you need two separate parties to contract, and although you have a person, and this person uh, is not you, it exists separately from you in that you can disassociate from it. But if you are associated with it, that's it, you're associated, and that person, which you point to, is evidence of a relationship, not between you and the person, but you and the people in the government. If you choose to wear what they consider to be essentially diapers, and then write on these diapers, my property. The fact that you've written on those diapers, my property, in no way changes the fact that you're still wearing diapers. And they will get to treat you as if you're wearing diapers. Imagine for a moment you go to a concert and you get a wristband. And they have different wristbands. One wristband allows you access upper levels only. Another wristband allows you access lower levels. Third wristband allows you access backstage. These are three separate rights and duties with certain obligations associated with it. You're the human being wearing the wristband. Can you enter into an agreement with your wristband that would change what the security people are going to allow you to do? If you were wearing a wristband that says you have access to the upper levels, can you write on it, oh, Rob, the man wearing it says backstage is okay, and then suddenly end up backstage? Obviously not. Your person is very much like that wristband. It's not you, but it does identify your rights, your duties, your obligations, your benefits, your burdens. It does not identify you, the human being. You cannot enter into a relationship or an agreement with it because it evidences an agreement between you, the human being, and other human beings. You can, however, disassociate from it and thus become a free man on the land. Heidi, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a little chat about people and their persons. Now let's suppose you're a human being and your name is John Adam Doe. First of all, I think we can all agree that your parents really lacked any sort of imagination, and I feel sorry for you. Might make identifying your body very difficult. However, let's suppose this is your true name. You're a living, breathing human being, and we start right there. This is the name that is found on the record of live birth or in your family Bible. Now, John Adam Doe here, at some point, decides to engage in certain activities. Now these activities, let's say he gets a social insurance number, he applies for one, through an act of application, he opens up an account with the Canada Revenue Agency and this is the name on it. Now he has, so he has by his own action, uh, engaged in uh, application and now he is accepted certain rights and duties. Now let's suppose also he goes and he gets a driver's license. He applies for that and now he has certain rights and duties under that driver's license and again it's always through an act of application, submission of application on your part. He joins the army and they, they decide to go give him the name Doe J.A. and that's what they use. Let's say he needs a hunting license. So he gets one, again through the act of application. Let's say he gets a health club membership card and he uses the name John Doe on that. So now you have a human being who has certain rights and duties and as you can see, with every different spelling of the name, you have a different body of rights and duties. And it is this body of rights and duties which does in fact create the person that they act upon. 
Now, if John gets stopped, drive, he's traveling down the road, he's driving, and he's speeding, and the cops stop him, and they ask him for his license, he's not going to be able to give him the hunting license and claim that that right there is sufficient for this body of rights and duties. So what you end up is with one human being, you can have innumerable different persons associated with that one human being. So when, uh, let's say the health club, if his membership expires or he decides that he no longer wishes to associate with them, he can actually erase that person and in so doing, free himself from any of the, the burden of the rights and duties. So if he erases that, by John Doe, by Health Club. Now he loses the rights and duties that were associated with that Health Club membership with that person, but the human being still in existence and he can still, uh, if he wants, open up his own Health Club. What I'm asking that you realize is that as a human being, when I say you have a person, that is true. You do, but you have numerous persons likely. And this is why you as the living, breathing human being cannot claim to be acting as an agent for this principle, which is what many people try to do. If you say you're an agent for the John J.A. Doe who has a hunting license and you try to claim that you're agent for that, well then here you are, this J.A. Doe is merely evidence of this right here. And now you're claiming that this right here negates that. And that's why the courts refused against it. It's very difficult for you, John Adam Doe, the true living, breathing human being, to engage in a contractual relationship that creates an agent relationship, an agent association, with something that exists only because of your previous uh, uh, application. Now, there does seem to be significant confusion as to what a free man on the land is and what what one can do with it. Pretty sure I'm, I, I see where the confusion stems. Um, I'd like you to watch a little clip from a, an online buddy of mine, a man who has a great deal of my respect. Uh, he says some things here which with which I, I agree strongly and some things with which I do not agree at all. Um, but we'll... we'll uh, it's the anti-terrorist, and I'd like you to take a little short boo at some of this. Hello, friends. I am the anti-terrorist. I hope that you all got to this meeting of the minds safely and without incident. And I hope that you will all enjoy the next few hours or the next day that you spend together in sharing these ideas and concepts. Looking around you now, you can see how fast this movement is growing, or not, as the case may be. I hope there's more than a handful of you. Unfortunately, I cannot be there. I'm not in the country at the moment. My respect goes out to the organizers. It takes a great deal of courage and hard work to get something like this together. I know from my own personal experience. As you're going through your curriculum today, I hope you'll consider the nature of what a free man on the land is and how it pertains to commerce and your engagement in this activity. Commerce is here. It's been here for thousands of years. Those of you who came to this meeting today who have already filed your affidavits no doubt have gone through at least five or six avenues of commerce just to get there, whether it be buying petrol, using a credit card or cash, getting a train, paying for food, See, commerce is all around us. There is no escape from it. It is what it is. I would advocate that you learn to navigate the seas of commerce as opposed to jumping ship. It's a very lonely, wide, deep ocean out there. And unless you're on a ship, unless you're sailing it, and unless you're in control of it, you don't have a lot of options, in my opinion. So my advice to you is to reconsider the free man option. Reconsider leaving the society reconsider relinquishing your national insurance number. Okay, now this is what I have a bit of a, an issue with here when he starts talking like that. I certainly do recommend that you, you make up your own mind. However, he is operating upon an assumption which is entirely false. 
he points out that you engaged in commerce or that people engaged in commerce to get to a meeting entirely true and then he m makes mention of the the uh, essentially what is a sin in Canada a social insurance number and he implies the inferences that you need that in order to engage in commerce this is false now as a ward of the state you are restricted from engaging in certain lawful activities merely because you're a child so let's say you're here and you're a child little happy child and you have a parent now you want to go to a store and you want to buy something now of course the parent can just go there the parent can go to the store and purchase or sell but in a sense engage in commerce however if you are a ward of the state and you're acting in a, in a manner which is essentially you're a child then you do if you want to go to the store and uh, engage in commerce and buy candy then you might need the permission of the, your nanny or of the state of your ward so permission would be necessary in that point now does this mean that if you want to engage in commerce that you need your your sin or your permission from the nanny in order to uh, engage in these activities of course not the things that you can do as a child with the permission of the state are things that you can do if you come over here and you grow up you no longer exist with a nanny giving you permission but this does not mean you can't buy petrol you can't operate an um, automobile it doesn't even mean you can't get a driver's license and use it for specific purposes on the road as a free man on the land so the assumption that he makes with his, with his address there is that because we have been conditioned to rec to associate a certain body of permission a certain amount of permission with the act of of, of commerce the assumption is that that permission is required to engage in that commerce but that is only the case if you are operating as a ward of the state if you're not a ward of the state you can engage in all the commerce you want so it's not so much jumping ship it's more like walking on water and if you do really need to keep with the ship analogy become captain of your own ship so you're not jumping ship by becoming a free man on the land and he makes reference to society and he says well keep your membership in society but again I gotta say hey T you, you disappoint me what's the name of the society you suggest that they maintain an association with can you tell me that you guys who are planning on checking out of the system my question to you is how are you going to get your gas and your electricity and your water these utility companies have a monopoly and they refuse to contract with you on a private basis they need your person to be able to give you those things and you need your person to get them so unless you're going to live in the forest and use the methane escaping from your dung heap or your compost pile my recommendation is that you use your person wisely I hope you all have a wonderful educational inspiring day and that you all leave from this event more empowered and more knowledgeable than when you came. Thanks for listening. how to operate as a creditor as a sovereign now 
With this whole creditor and uh, debtor thing, I see a bit of a problem with it. Certainly no one wants to be a debtor. And a lot of people then say, well, if being a debtor is bad, being a creditor must be good. And they assume these are the only two options. Yet, without sounding like a Bible thumper, I've learned a whole lot about the law by looking at the teachings of Jesus Christ. The man knew the law. And his advice was to be neither debtor nor creditor. And therefore, there must be another option. And looking at it, I mean, what is our, what is our goal here, folks? I, I like to say that we're looking for peace and abundance. Now, here, if what we're looking at, let's look at it. We want peace and abundance. If you're the debtor, it's going to get any of it's going to it might be difficult to get any of that if you're the creditor however your abundance will always be a function of the debtors ability and willingness to pay And if he has neither, you have zero abundance. Now, what can a, a creditor, there's a big difference between a creditor and a debtor, and there's one fundamental thing a creditor can do in terms of a loan, which a debtor may not do. And what is that one thing that a, a creditor can do that a debtor cannot? forgive the creditor has the power of forgiveness on their side and they can forget the loan or forgive the loan that exists between them and now the debtor is no longer the debtor now the real problem with being either of them I see it is that it does require you if you're the, the creditor you're placing a demand on your fellow man and you can't forgive it. If you're the debtor, then you've placed a burden on them without sharing one back. Is there someplace else, though? The big problem that I see is that all of our abundance, what, what, the, what people like the anti-terrorists there are talking about, they're talking about positioning yourself to be a creditor so that you can demand money. And they equate abundance with money. Now the problem with this is that the people who put the money in circulation can restrict the amount of money out there, thus create a situation where it's very difficult for the debtor to meet the demands of the creditor, and therefore neither of them enjoy any abundance. Being a creditor doesn't generate, doesn't guarantee abundance when your abundance is a function of the amount of money in circulation and its value. Make all the demands you want. It doesn't mean anything past a certain point. So saying join the system, learn to be a creditor, to me I think that's kind of wrong because you're you're betting that your abundance will be a function of the amount of money available which you can demand from other parties. Now what if there is in fact another source of abundance? Let's examine that because that's what it's about abundance. If we have abundance and we don't have to fight over it we'll get peace. You guys who are planning on checking out of the system my question to you is, how are you going to get your gas and your electricity and your water? These utility companies have a monopoly and they refuse to contract with you on a private basis. They need your person to be able to give you those things and you need your person to get them. So unless you're going to live in the forest and use the methane escaping from your dung heap. Now, what I'd like you to do is imagine for a moment an island, an actual geographical area, say. Now, in this geographical area on this island there is a house and in the house you have a parent and a child now you also have another building over here that's a shopkeeper and the parent goes to the shopkeeper and engages in commerce 
Now the child wants to go to the store and buy stuff for the house, but he needs permission from the parent in order to engage in commerce. This is essentially the situation as it exists now with the government. And what the anti-terrorist is suggesting is that if you do not stay in the house and maintain that uh, child and ward relationship with the state, then you don't have a right to go engage in commerce and you should leave the island. And it's complete baloney. Because you can grow up and if you want, you can create your own house you can be the adult in your own house and you can go and engage in commerce whenever you want you do not need this party's permission and you do not have to obey the rules of this house and you do not have to leave the island this person that he refers to is the person that identifies you as a child of the state but bear in mind, a person is that legal subject or substance of which the rights and duties are attributes. This guy right here, the kid, can in fact have a person and that person will be deemed to be a ward of the state and using their permission they can go and engage in commerce. It's all fine and dandy. But that child can also grow up, become a man, and do all of that all by himself without a permission from this government state agent nanny and he does in fact have a person but his person is now on par or is equal with this adult and is not equal with the child it, let's suppose that this here represents the country and this here represents an estate in that country People, when they, uh, if they belong to a very, like, rich families, they have a, a rich estate. When they grow up and they leave the house, some of the funds from that estate are still used, are still sent to him. He can collect it, and oftentimes it'll be in the form of a trust fund until he's maybe 30, at which point it transfers to him. The anti-terrorist position is, the only way to go here and buy things is with their permission and if you don't have their permission you must leave the house and you must leave the the whole island the town you must go live out in the bush I'm a free man on the land I've got the right to engage in commerce I'm not going to live out in the bush and anything the child can do with permission of their nanny of their war of their 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 parent this guy can do without any permission just as lawfully so his position that you should keep your your person otherwise you have to leave you otherwise you don't get the benefits of commerce and you have to go live in the bush all three of those points are completely wrong the only thing that is affected is you won't be able to claim that this party here has a duty to feed you or put diapers on you but nor will that party have the power to put diapers on you if you don't want them a lot of people consider the person to be merely this child and if you abandon if you grow up you're abandoning your person but more likely if you look in the, in the criminal code and in certain other acts you'll find that they refer to persons and classes of person this guy right here, person. This guy, person. This guy, a person. This guy, a person. But they all have different rights and duties. Your person doesn't necessarily, just because this guy says I'm a person and this guy says I'm a person too, doesn't mean they both have the same level of rights and duties. Because this guy's a person as a ward of the state. So yeah, he's a person, he has rights and duties. But his rights and duties, he's going to have less rights than this person over here. Some people seem to equate a person with a ward of the state. And a ward of the state is merely one class of person. Now, folks, here's the fundamental problem with the whole creditor-debtor thing. It doesn't shift where we are looking for our abundance. It's still looking at fiat currency, the creation of which we have very little control over. And then they think because now you're a creditor instead of a debtor, your demands are going to automatically be met and meet your needs and bring you abundance. And I don't think it's going to work. 
Now the problem with that, of course, is because people are equating their abundance with their access to resources. And this is a simple graph. This is what we're facing. The number of people is increasing. The number of resources are dwindling. And when we get past this point right here, we get into this area where the number of people and their needs is greater than the resources. That's what essentially is hell on earth. And the problem with that is not so much the number of people, but that those people believe their, their value and their abundance is a function of their access to the resources. What if there's another place to find abundance? Now, where would we find it if not the resources? How about this? How about we find our abundance in the people? If we find abundance in the people, and now I'm not saying use the people as a resource, you know, a la soylent green, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is what if the abundance is actually a function of the people's creativity? Then you start to develop a situation where your abundance will be a function not of how much resources you have managed to withhold from your fellow man, but how much inspiration you have brought them to be creative. And when people get creative like that, they start to enjoy an abundance. And whether or not it's just learning to uh, play music whether or not it's learning to be creative with figuring out energy needs and ways to meet them. By uh, focusing on increasing our fellow man's creativity, we will find all the abundance we need. It'll end up being where you have people where you go and you give them a potato and you teach them to cut it open and plant four pieces and they get 50 pounds of potatoes out of it, they come to you saying, look, I've got extra potatoes. And that one you give them will come back to you sevenfold. When people start realizing that abundance should be a function of our creativity and not of our ability to monopolize resources, we can actually avoid this situation because although the people will increase, and the resources might necessarily dwindle. Our ability to share and use the resources we have is what's going to save us. Do -do -do. Okay, folks, so bear in mind what we're aiming for here is greater peace and abundance. So what this implies to me is that we must avoid conflict and that means we must study how it comes about. Having looked at it rather extensively, I've come to the conclusion that just about all conflict is a result of one thing. And that is when one party feels that they have been denied something which is due. And that one thing is almost always dignity. Now, dignity, it can manifest in, in certain ways. Some people might know it as respect, honor, kindness, compassion. All of these have the effect of causing the recipient to feel a greater level of dignity and they feel raised up. And almost all conflict is a result of one party feeling that they have been denied dignity due. Now even when it comes to resources, if you're arguing about water, uh, one party might feel, hey, I need water to live and when you deny me water, you're denying me my right to live and therefore you're denying me my dignity. Just about 
every conflict can be pointed, if you examine it, will lead back to someone being denied the dignity they felt was due. And it was done in such a manner that they felt fighting, conflict, and uh, aggression was justified at that point. So if we want peace and abundance, we want to avoid conflict, what does this then necessarily imply? We have to increase the level of human dignity around those, uh, of those around us. If you want to avoid conflict, act with compassion, kindness, honor, and respect towards each other. You won't end up naturally in conflict, and you will be granting people the dignity that they feel is due. Now the trick, of course, is how do you do that? And again, you use any of these tools. Give them respect. Give them some honor. Give them some kindness. Give them some compassion. Merely be aware of their existence when they didn't expect you to be. And you'll be surprised at what can develop when you do that. Oh, and incidentally, I can talk about all these things, but that doesn't mean I'm an expert on it. I know I need a lot of work in being more patient and compassionate and treating people with the dignity they're due. But at least I'm working on it. Okay folks, this lesson, you actually have two, two assignments. Because it's about people and it's about persons. Assignment number one, I want you to distinguish all of your persons. Go through your wallets and grab all your identification cards. Make a little list of all of your persons. I want you to look at how you got it. Think back when you're looking at your driver's license, your hunting license, whatever one you're looking at. How did you get it? What steps were required? Why did you do that? Think back. What rights did you get out of that? R rights or privileges? What duties and obligations did you accept? And what, now that you know a little bit more about the law, what would some of your options have been? So that's assignment number one, do that with your rights. It's gonna help you, it'll come, it'll be important in the future. Lesson number two, or assignment number two, we're dealing with people. I want you to go out and I want you to give someone a dignity surprise. Show them some respect, some kindness, uh, something that acknowledges that they are due dignity as a human being. Do that with no strings attached to it and see how it makes you feel, how it empowers you and watch how you will start to uh, crack the wellsprings of abundance. But don't do it for the abundance, just do it to raise them up and to grant them the dignity that you feel that they are due as a human being. So those are your assignments for lesson three. Thank you.